So what you're saying is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest today uh, recently had one of the most discussed books in religious circles, well, for the past decade. It was called The Benedict Option. This is it here. And it was a bestseller. Rod Dreher uh, is a senior editor at the American Conservative. He's the, also contributed to numerous publications, such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post. He has a new book out, Live Not by Lies. It's a manual for Christian dissidents. I'm very pleased he's joining me today from America. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed for coming on, Rod. Um, Thanks for having me, Peter. It's a pleasure. Um, can I explain, first of all, this Live Not by Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents, um, is it aimed entirely at Christians? or Because when I was reading it, and it seemed to me that it could also be a manual for conservatives, for example. It, it, would you say that that is correct? Yeah, I, that is absolutely correct. I wrote it as a Christian for Christians, and the people I interviewed in the former Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc were Christian dissidents. But uh, I found, much to my pleasure and, and delight, that uh, it has a readership beyond Christians and even beyond conservatives. Uh, Barry Weiss is a very brave young American journalist. She's uh, a Jewish lesbian on the center left, and she's taken up the book and is championing the book because she said the, the fight that we're all facing now against militant wokeness is something that everyone uh, who believes in old-fashioned liberal values of free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, uh, and so forth, need to embrace. Also in the U.S., Brett Weinstein, a professor and biologist, he and his wife, Heather Hying, also a professor, were driven out of their university because they would not go along with wokeness, even though they are both atheist and of the left. They've been championing the book. So we do have to form these alliances across religious boundaries, even across political boundaries, to defend the sort of society that we recognize as good. I think that there are a couple of instances actually in Live Not By Lies where I think you mentioned, uh, uh, for example, a Christian uh, being asked by a died in the war liberal to go to church, for example, with him. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure I recall that, that particular story. Could you tell me a little bit more? Well, it's just that the basically you were making the point that, of course, we you know, have to reach out, as it were, to liberals, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, and that basically there was a, somebody who was, you know, pretty staunch liberal, just simply wanting to see what he could possibly get from going to the church with the Christian guy. Right, right. And, you know, I, I was told when I was in Prague, uh, I was interviewing a woman named Camilla Bendova. She's an older woman now. She and her late husband, Václav Benda, were the only Christians in Václav Havel's inner circle of dissidents. And uh, they, I remember asking her, because they're fairly strict Catholics, the, yeah. the Bendas, said, how, how did you work, you and your husband work along with the other dissidents? because Václav Havel's circle was famously, no pun intended, bohemian. You know, they traded partners all the time. Camilla said, listen, when you're in a situation where everybody is afraid to speak out, when you find someone who is brave enough to risk their livelihood and, and their liberty, even their life, to stand up against totalitarianism, that person is your friend and ally and must be. So we have to try to learn more about each other's lives and figure out what, what we have in common and where we can stand together in common against this common enemy. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, if, I, if I could just explain uh, to people who aren't familiar, I mean, what I would say, first of all, Rod, is that when, when we get a lot of comments coming back to us on this channel from people and they're with us and they understand the problems, we don't almost have to go into them, the, 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 the problems of woke, wokeness, the fact that these orthodoxies are now in place and you disregard them at your peril, all of these things. Um, but they always say to me, what do we do, right? 
what should we do? And it seems to me that, first of all, with the Benedict option, and, and now in a way with Live Not By Lies, you are sort of setting out what people might possibly do, right. aren't you? That's right. You know, the Benedict option was written. It, it's a more explicitly Christian book. It's saying, look, we live in a post-Christian uh, civilization now. And uh, uh, mind you, in America, we're behind Britain in terms of de-Christianization, but we're, we're getting there very quickly. Uh, so how do we live as Christians to hold on to our faith in a time when we may actually be persecuted for the faith, or at least one is social, socially marginalized for being a practicing Christian? Live Not By Lies, uh, by contrast, is about what Christians should do, and not only Christians, but conservatives should do in a world in which they are actively persecuted. And so what I did with this book is I, well, let me back up a bit. The the the, um, the origin of the book came when I got a phone call from a prominent American physician whose elderly mother lived with him. She had been born, she was born in Czechoslovakia, uh, had been sent to prison for four years by the communist authorities for being a quote, Vatican spy, meaning that she refused to stop going to, to prayer meetings at her Catholic church. The old lady eventually emigrated to America after she was released from prison, had her family here and lived her life. She was saying to her son, son, the things I'm seeing happen in America now remind me so much of what I saw when communism first came to my country. And uh, she's talking about this wokeness, this, uh, this uh, people losing their jobs for saying the wrong thing, having the social media mob turn on them and so forth. Well, when the doctor said that to me, uh, Peter, I said, well, that's pretty scary, but it sounds kind of alarmist. I mean, my mother's elderly too. She watches a lot of cable news and gets, gets frightened. So what I did was I contacted this couple I know in the UK at Cambridge, the Bolabashes, Bela and Gabby Bolabash, uh, defected from Hungary in the 1960s. He was a star mathematician. He went on to teach at Trinity College, Cambridge, became a Don there and has recently retired. I asked Bela, I said, this is what the old Czech woman said, is it true? He said, oh, absolutely it's true. Gabby and I in our retirement here in the UK, we're watching the BBC daily, we're reading the newspapers, and we keep saying, this is just like our youth. And again, Peter, it was it's the same thing, you know, terror of being canceled, of, being, of losing everything. Bela even said to me, he said that people here, progressives, have no uh, no problem lying about you to get you, to destroy you if you're the political opponent. I thought about that several years later when uh, the, the new statesman came after uh, Sir Roger Scruton, mm. right? Mm. And uh, this was what they're talking about. So the book I have written was to go over and speak. I, I went over to Europe and uh, the former Eastern Europe and Russia to speak to dissidents, to say, what can we do to prepare ourselves to resist what is coming? And that that's the book. Do you see yourself as a dissident? You know, I, I never have. I'm a middle class guy. I'm a conservative, not a Republican. I'm a conservative. I'm a church going Christian. I have kids. I live a very comfortable hobbit like life. But increasingly, I am becoming a dissident because if you do not completely endorse the, the the woke agenda, so to speak, on race, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, sex, and so on, then you are not just wrong, you're evil. I, I've written three New York Times bestsellers now. Uh, I've been a, a journalist for over 30 years, but there's no way I could be hired now at a major American newspaper simply because of the stances I've taken. And uh, I, I, it's weird to think that as a conservative, I'm really an old fashioned liberal because I want there to be freedom of speech, diversity of opinion. I want to be challenged when I'm, or when someone thinks I'm wrong about something. I don't, I can separate ideas from identity, but this I think is one of the core problems of what we're dealing with now. You have this generation of progressives who can't separate ideas from identity and who believe that if you object to what they're saying, then you're denigrating them as people. This is insane, but this is where we are. Also, you know, the point as well, you mentioned about Roger Scruton there, but just generally is that one of the things that seems to be in common with the Soviet way of doing things uh, is to delegitimize the actual person, you know, to, to actually delegitimize them, you know, don't take any notice of them, X or Y, right. because they are this. So now it's very much, if you're a white heterosexual male, isn't it? 
Yeah, and uh, I, just today I was reading in the newspaper that in the city of Oakland, California, a very woke city, uh, a group of donors, private donors, have given money to the mayor to distribute to very poor families who are suffering in this COVID lockdown. But white people, poor white families, are not allowed to get any of this money. This is madness, you know, that to uh, the, the left in, in doing this, I guess they see all white people as being oppressors. This is what social justice theory tells them. And um, these poor people aren't really poor. They are actually of the oppressor class. I see what's happening is the uh, the left is delegitimizing any any opposition coming from people who are of the wrong social categories. This is exactly what happened in the Soviet Union. I, in Live Not By Lies, my book, I have a, a quote from Martin Latsis. He was the head of the Cheka, the predecessor of the KGB, in Ukraine right after the uh, communist revolution. And he sent out a, a, a communique to his agents to help them understand how to enforce the red terror. He said, don't look at individuals and ask and try to find out what they themselves did to oppose the Soviet regime. That doesn't matter. Rather, look at them and ask yourself, which social class do they belong to? And that will tell you whether or not to oppress them. This, he said, is the, the essence of the red terror. Well, we have the same thing, perhaps, you know, we're not sending people to gulag yet or killing them. Maybe it's more of a pink terror than a red terror. But we do see exactly this, where people are judged guilty by virtue of um, various aspects of their identity, their race, their sexual desire, their their um, you, you know their uh, uh, so their even their political party. They are guilty of crimes even if they did not commit them. And this, I think, Peter, it, it's crazy that the the backlash. The, the, the genuinely fascist backlash that this is going to call up. I mean, I, I guess the woke think that the uh, that people are just going to keep taking it and taking it and taking it. But, um, you know, I, I live in a part of the U.S. that's very conservative. There are a lot of poor people here, both black and white. And uh, to have the these elites who run all the American institutions, uh, even uh, certainly corporations, and now it's even come to the military, to have them all denouncing wide swathes of the American population as being guilty somehow of racism and bigotry solely because of the color of their skin and, and factors like that, it cannot help but cause a tremendous backlash. They, the left has no idea the kind of demons that it is summoning up. Uh, you mentioned there, <clears throat> Rod, the, I mean, first of all, when you talk about the people getting uh, welfare, you know, and but only black people, you know, we're talking about racism here, actually, aren't we? I mean, you know, it's, it's anti-white. There's no other way of, of putting it. Uh, you mentioned there the military. Um, how can you just give us a, a broad picture of how the military in America is becoming wokeified? It, it has succumbed to this new orthodoxy. Yeah, this is something extraordinary, and it's happened very quickly. Uh, the military is, like every other institution in American society, it has been affected by this ideology that is spreading among elite networks, this woke ideology. Well, um, Tucker Carlson, our TV host, a conservative TV host, he recently criticized the military for being concerned more with social engineering by having their officers read uh, the works of Ibram Kendi, who's this he's now the guru of the moment about anti-racism. It's really neo-racism. Um, but by, by having the officers read that and by, uh, by being really concerned about getting uh, pregnant women, body armor, things like that, Tucker Carlson said, wait, are we forgetting that the role of any military is to win wars and protect the country, not to do social engineering? Well, it was fascinating to see that the senior brass at the military at the pentagon came down on tucker carlson like a ton of bricks this is extraordinary that uh, the military should never do that should never whether if they if they were coming down on far left uh, journalists criticizing them it is the role of the military like the the royal family in your country to not engage politically but they did and uh, i i think what's happening i've been getting a lot of emails from uh, soldiers and sailors saying, yeah, I feel like there's no place for me in this military now, that they are clearly going to start discriminating on the basis of, uh, of race and sex. And, uh, and I feel that um, I, I, 
I have to get out. I was even told by a man uh, I met in Virginia recently. He works at the Pentagon, a soldier, and he told me that uh, he it's his it's his privilege to serve. But he has a newborn son, and he sees now that he has to tell his son, I can't recommend that you go into this military because it doesn't care about defending the country, or rather that it does, but that's not job one. Job one is to uh, is to satisfy this ideological um, uh, structure that's that's making America weaker. Yes. You mentioned in the book, uh, you, you use the term a lot in Live Not By Lies, uh, the term soft totalitarianism. I think you've sort of already referred to it maybe by, you, when you sort of talk about the pink, as it were, pink uh, uh, orthodoxy yeah. or whatever. But basically this is sort of, if you like, a, a more of a slow creep totalitarianism, would you, is that how you would characterize it? Sure, that's part of it. Um, I, you know, whenever we talk about totalitarianism, the first images that come to mind are the, are the gulags and the secret police, the KGB, the midnight knock at the door, George Orwell, 1984, because that has been our experience of totalitarianism in the 20th century. Well, what's happening now, the, these, these people who grew up under hard totalitarianism, they sense that the same thing is coming now, but it's coming in a much softer way, in a, in a way that has more to do with uh, creating a safe space, so-called safe space, turning the whole country into that. And it's coming for therapeutic reasons. Like we, we, we mustn't say anything critical of, uh, because we might be, uh, we might trigger someone. We might, they may not be able to, to handle it. All of this is part of its softness, but it, I think the essence of it goes uh, not to Orwell, but to Aldous Huxley and Brave New World. You know, the, the, the two great totalitarian novels in English of the 20th century were 1984 and Huxley's Brave New World. If you read Brave New World, the, to, the totalitarianism, the dystopia they've set up there is one based on comfort. In Orwell, the, the controller's big brother uses fear and pain and terror to coerce people into conformity. But in the world controllers in uh, Brave New World actually dose them with drugs that make them feel pleasure, give them all the sex they want, porn, entertainment. Uh, it is a, and they're happy to give up their individual rights or political rights for the sake of this comfort and this constant feeling good. Uh, there's a scene in, in chapter 17 of Brave New World in which uh, Mustafa Mann, the world controller for Europe, confronts the dissident there, John the Savage. And he says to him, John, why wouldn't you want to join this society? Uh, there's comfort everywhere. We have, he calls it Christianity without tears. Well, the savage says, well, I don't want that. You're all too comfortable. I want uh, sin. I want God. I want love. I want passion. I'm, he wants to be human. And uh, Mustafa Man says to him, well, it sounds like you're fighting for your right to be unhappy. John says, yes, that's what I'm fighting for. So all of that, Peter, is simply to say that we are dealing now with the totalitarianism that is, is creeping along uh, by trying to make people, uh, trying to play on people's fears of being unhappy. And, uh, and I think we're seeing, in fact, I know we're seeing, especially the younger generations in this country, people being completely willing to see uh, political liberties like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so forth, go by the wayside as long as they are being cast aside in an effort to keep people from being anxious and afraid and unsafe. Uh, it, it's real madness, but, um, you know, and, and people can't see it coming. So many of my fellow Americans can't see it coming because they're, they're looking like behind some Maginot line. They're, they're looking for the KGB and the Gulags to come back when in fact, the soft totalitarianism is going through Belgium to extend the metaphor. Uh, and, and taking over our institutions and managing to marginalize people and push them out of their careers and silence them without ever once having to bring the power of the state against them. It's interesting, you know, that uh, Marx quite famously is one, one of the th things that most people know about Marx is that he thought that uh, Britain would be the first country to have a revolution simply because it was the first to industrialize with a working class and that Russia would be way down the list because it was agrarian and feudal. Uh, now, in our time, you would sort of, I would always say, well, America is the absolute last place where any of this is going to happen. But do you think that America is in a revolutionary state, given your terms of reference mm -hmm. about Huxley, 
or a pre-revolutionary one? It does appear like that from the outside. Mm. You know, I in Live Not By Lies, I have a chapter devoted to Hannah Arendt yes. and her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Arendt, as uh, your viewers no doubt know, was a German-Jewish refugee from Nazism. And after the war, she wrote a book that in which she attempted to explain why it was that Germany and Russia both went in for totalitarianism, two different totalitarianisms, but totalitarianism all the same. And she discerned that there were certain aspects of those pre-totalitarian societies that made them susceptible. Arendt says by far the most important uh, aspect of a pre-totalitarian society is mass alienation and atomization, mass loneliness. Uh, because people who are disconnected from other people, from institutions and ways of life, traditional ways of life, they become susceptible to anyone who comes in and tells them, I we'll give you meaning, we'll give you solidarity, we'll give you purpose, just believe what we're telling you. Well, I think that that absolutely describes contemporary America, and I think that's one reason why wokeness has moved so fast, especially among the elites who are deracinated from uh, any any form of tradition, the, uh, alienated from institutions, and fearful about the future of America. So they're conforming. And uh, I, I don't know whether we're pre-revolutionary in America in terms of uh, taking up arms. I certainly hope not. But uh, this thing is going a lot farther than I imagined it ever would. Uh, my mother was telling me that she's more afraid now for our country than she ever has been. Mm -hmm. And I, I reminded her, I said, well, look, you lived through the riots of the late 60s, early 70s and all those bombings. And she said, yeah, I know. But there, we felt then that there was at least a, a, a strong base in the middle of the country that would keep things from going too off track. Now, Peter, that has gone. And I think one reason it has gone is because of the, the power of the Internet and social media to dissolve any sort of local um, local ties, local ties of authority that might keep keep uh, people grounded. When I was in Poland last year doing reporting for, two years ago actually, for doing reporting for Live Not By Lies, uh, I spoke to a teacher, a, a Brit who teaches high school in Poland, and he said that nothing in that country is more powerful in terms of influencing the youth than social media. Not the church, not the family, certainly not the state or any other institution in Polish society. It's all globalized social media. TikTok will is forming the next generations in these countries, even countries that had the experience of totalitarianism. This, I think, is the core of the revolution that is uh, brewing here in America and uh, no doubt also in Western Europe. You in the book, you make the point that obviously, you know, this isn't just a an analysis of, of what's happening, how do you react to it? So obviously, Live Not By Lies is a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, which you mention in the book. Essentially, what you're saying in this, Rod, is it not that you just simply just, it's an, almost an act of revolution to defy, you know, in other words, I will not go along with your definition. I will not, yes, sign it on the dotted line. I will not do this. What are the kind of instances? Because people will want to know, how can they practically do this? What are the instances mm -hmm. that you would suggest? Where can they make their point? Mm -hmm. I got an email yesterday from a vicar in the Church of England, uh, somewhere, I forget which diocese, in which he was sending me data from uh, mailings from the bishops of the C of E saying that they're going all in on critical race theory, which uh, is going to destroy the church. It, it's clearly going to do that. But he wanted to know now. He said that we, we can't stop this, but uh, it doesn't look that we can stop this. So I want to be part of forming some sort of underground resistance to it. So I was able to put him in touch with uh, other people I know in the Church of England who are starting to build this sort of resistance. That's one example. I don't know what form that resistance will take, but... Um, they clearly believe that we have to build an underground in resistance to the corrupted bishops of our own church because we cannot live by the lies that they're expecting us to. You know, I, I mentioned in the book the case uh, Václav Havel brought up. You know, he was the first president of a free Czechoslovakia and spent time in prison as a political prisoner. He brought up a, a, a fictional case in a 1977 essay he wrote called The Power of the Powerless. And in it, he, he talks about this fictional greengrocer 
let's say the greengrocer has to live like everybody else does in the city. They have to put a sign up in their shop window saying, workers of the world unite, the Marxist slogan. Well, nobody believes it, but everybody does this, so they'll, uh, they won't have any trouble. Well, what happens if the greengrocer decides uh, to take the sign down? He said, I don't believe this. I'm not going to, to say what I don't believe. What happens to him? The government comes, they take away his business from him. Uh, he has to work as a janitor or something. His kids can't go to the best universities. There is a real price to be paid. But what happens uh, when he suffers for his principles uh, in public? He shows everybody else that it is possible to live in truth if you're willing to suffer for it. And, it, and if enough people are willing to do that, the system will fall apart, said Havel. I would suggest to listeners and viewers of this podcast, think about ways you are compelled to say things you don't believe, or at least stay silent to avoid getting in trouble. Think about what it would take to stand up. Think about, or think about the cost to you of not standing up, of being silent. I think first of all, you should start looking for jobs in which you will not be pressured this way before you stand up. But at, at some point, you have to stand up. You have to take your kids out of these schools where this garbage is being taught. You have to be willing to pay a price, publicly or privately, for integrity. This is the thing that uh, the core of, of what I say in Live Not By Lies and what I heard from Peter from these the people in, in Eastern Europe and the former communist countries, that suffering is the key here. Being willing to take these risks to lose money, to lose status, to be marginalized, to be hated. But if you do it for the sake of truth, you will triumph in the end. It is difficult, isn't it? But in some ways, you know, it's, if one's going to give advice to young people about jobs now, you know, it happens to me sometimes, you know, I've got godsons and, and, and things. Um, you're almost sort of find yourself saying just don't do anything where you're going to be in a corporation don't do yeah. anything where you're going to so it comes down to well it would have come down to the armed services but it seems like not anymore <laughs> no but essentially in other words be your own boss that's the only thing maybe mm. less left to you absolutely that's and that is precisely the advice i'm giving to my younger son he's I have two boys uh one is 21 one is 17 the 21 year old wants to go into museum work. And I've tried to tell him, like, mm. this is such a woke profession that it's going to be very hard for you as an honest person to do the work you want to do. But I guess he's gonna give it a try and we'll have to learn it on his own. The 17 year old, I'm telling him exactly that, be a plumber or something like that, or own your own business. Mm. Uh, and it's it's awful that it should come to this. It should not come to this, but this is, the, this is reality. This yeah. is where we are. I, uh, in, in the Benedict Option book, uh, a physician told me, a prominent American physician who would not let me name him, said that he does not want his own children to go into medicine because he can see how quickly it is becoming heavily politicized. Since that man told me that, it has now become standard procedure in American hospitals and in, in American medicine to, um, w when someone presents themselves, even a minor, saying that I am gender dysphoric, I want to be whatever the opposite sex is, you have to affirm it. Even if it is against your best medical judgment, even if you have nothing against transgenders at all, but you think that's not gonna help this person, doesn't matter. That's a political matter, you have to affirm it. I can see now why this doctor would not want his children doing that, because you have to lie as a, for the sake of keeping your medical license. Yes. The, the Benedict option you mentioned there, um, I, I kept on having these uh, v uh, images of the name of the rose, you know, the, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, and these sort of communities where they basically sort of protect, obviously, as in the Dark Ages, they protected mm -hmm. illuminated manuscripts, they, uh, various arts, artworks. Um, that's not obviously what you're saying, especially in the right. religion option, but the idea is somehow that one should, that there is safety in numbers. Is that, is that surely it, that you should make societies and keep your, you know, help each other, associate with each other? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost a re-ghettoization um, because there is safety in, in the ghetto to some extent. Now, I, I have to qualify that. I'm not talking about um, uh, physical safety. Uh, although there may be that too, but I'm talking about people who want to keep their culture and people who want to keep their faith. 
Um, if I don't believe that we should head for the hills and build high walls. I don't live that way. I don't recommend living that way. I, but I, I think that if we are going to keep, uh, as Christians at least, if we're going to keep a, a, a robust faith, we need to build thicker communities of faith and discipleship so that when we go out into the world, we can be faithful Christians and represent Jesus Christ in, in the proper way. A friend of mine, uh, 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 Andrew Sullivan, who is a, you know, gay and, um, and a conservative, he said, he told me that what the Benedict Option is, it, was, it served an important role for gay people, this sort of thing, going into gay neighborhoods in, uh, back before, you know, back in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, they found a lot of spiritual uh, and uh, moral strength there living together so where they, they didn't have to fear being beaten on the street or, or things like that. And they were, they were able to be together and, and celebrate their own culture. I don't see anything particularly wrong with that. I mean, it's certainly, it, it's certainly possible that people can withdraw into their own culture for malicious reasons, for racist reasons, or, but I don't think that any time, I, I don't think it's necessarily that. And uh, when I was in Italy, I, working on the Benedict Option book, I found this Catholic community at a seaside in an Italian, small Italian city, San Benedetto del Tronto. And these are the most wonderful, happy people. They're Catholic and very Catholic, but not angry about it. And they live in their own houses. Uh, they go to their own Catholic churches, but they come together around this uh, this sort of clubhouse to do things together, to grow uh, gardens, to build the community. They have their own community school called the Scuola G.K. Chesterton. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to live. They're, these are people who are not alienated from their church, from their tradition, or from each other. Um, they are enjoying their lives and they want, but they want to, it, it, this intensifies their commitment to each other and to the Catholic Church, living together as they do. And I, I think it's a wonderful way to live. And I wish I had something like that here. Mm. Um, finally, uh, Rod, uh, I, I want to ask you something. It's a little bit, it might seem a bit incoherent, but I know what I mean. So if I can see if I can <laughs> convey it to you. If, if you're incoherent, come sit by me and we'll, we'll have a great conversation. I think the thing is, is, is this, is I totally see everything that you're saying. Um, I have found that I would def define myself as a cultural Christian. I know that's a terrible get out possibly for people like you, but I would say that. No. I, I've never particularly believed, but I utterly see, um, particularly now that things are under attack, I would line up with it. I think Churchill said once, you know, he his attitude was to the church was a bit like a flying buttress. He supported it from the outside, right? That That's mm -hmm. always how I felt. However, I have found religion creeping in more and more to conversations I'm having with friends that never would have discussed religion. It's almost like we know something's happening, you know? Now, does that sound nebulous to you? But I would almost say, what would you say to me as someone who has never really believed actually, but, I, but at the same time <clears throat> completely would support Christianity in all its forms because it forms the basis of my society. <clears throat> but should I therefore go the, should I just not piggyback on it anymore and just sign up? What, 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 yeah. what would you say to that? Well, you can't sign up if you don't really believe. It's better to be faithful to your conscience. If your conscience tells you that uh, this isn't true or you can't affirm it, then listen to your conscience. I would hope that you would keep keep searching and keep an open mind and an open heart, and perhaps uh, perhaps the, the grace of God will uh, will call you in. I, I, I believe that God is always there, and he's always knocking, uh, wanting us to, to come to him, uh, to Christ. But that said, I'm glad to have you there. I'm glad that people can, people are like you, people like you can recognize the value of Christianity, though uh, and Tom Holland uh, in his recent book, Dominion, very good book, you know, he, is, uh, he writes in there about how he, though not a believer, has discovered the, the deep value of Christianity as the root of the things he does value as a liberal. Um, but I, I think that ultimately, uh, Peter, people, the reason you're having the kind of conversations you're having is people realize that you can't simply have cultural Christianity, that cult is the basis of culture. 
and that uh, if we are going to save the things that that many of us whether we're believers or not believe are worth saving that ultimately it's going to have to require some sort of serious religious commitment uh, when i was interviewing these people the, these dissidents um, from uh, in, in the former soviet bloc all of them said that if you're going to be able to withstand the kind of attacks that you're going to to get from uh, from the, your persecutors you have to be deeply rooted in, if not religion, then some kind of uh, serious, transcendent set of moral beliefs. Otherwise, you'll be crushed, because not because you're weak, but just because you know, there, there's no reason. If, if materialism is all there is, then you have every reason to capitulate. Well, um, so I, and I also think, and this is going to be my next book, Peter, that uh, the world is going to be re-enchanted one way or the other. Uh, because people cannot live with this flat materialism. Uh, uh, the, the novels of Michel Welbeck, that he's one of my favorite novelists, even though they're very grim, but I think he's absolutely spot on in his diagnosis of the, the malaise that is crushing uh, Western post-Christian civilization. Sooner or later, we're going to be re-enchanted. The question is, where is it going to come from? And uh, I think that uh, this is one reason I uh, am become more outspoken about my Christianity. I'm an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christian now, and I don't uh, I'm, I don't want to be a Christian who's a sort of nationalist or using it to bash people. But I do believe that um, that it's true, and that if we stand in the public square and testify to to what we believe is true, that other people who are feeling like you and your friends are will perhaps be drawn to it. That one of the men I write about in the book, Viktor Popkov, he was a, a Russian in the 1970s who was not raised with religion at all, but he became so overwhelmed by the, the malaise and the despondency of the late Soviet period that he didn't know what to do with his life. He read Camus and thought, I've got to find a reason to live. That's, how he di that's when he discovered this small group of Christians in Moscow led by a man named Alexander Ogorodnikov, who came from a prominent communist family, became a Christian in his 20s, and started a prayer group. Uh, Popkov said that they knew when they gathered in Moscow, the KGB was all around them, that they were being watched, and they were eventually going to all go to prison, as they did. But he said that uh, being there with that group of people who were willing to pray together and sing hymns together and just be together in freedom, he said that was golden. That, those were the, t the most meaningful times of my life. And I think in a similar way today, uh, we are going to find more and more people of goodwill like yourself who do not espouse uh, the, the religion of Christianity, but who can see from the outside something very good there and who want to be part of it. And my friend Douglas Murray is a lot like this too. I mean, he's one of the best allies Christians can have, M much better ally than many Christians because he's an honest man and a brave man. So uh, you know, God bless these, these men and women who, who are fellow travelers yes, <laughs> of, yes. of Christians. But uh, I do hope that eventually they, will, uh, they and you will come to embrace the source of the things that give us joy and meaning. Well, thank you. It does seem to be that there is some, some sort of acknowledgement that more is needed, you know, that that it's not just enough to say, oh, yeah, sure, I'm with you. You know, th there is this feeling because I can just tell you the, the people that I I know, the, obviously you don't know them, uh, who would never have been thinking about this at one point. And I think it's testament to, to what we're up against, which is what you talk sure. about in your book. Um, but the, your, the book, by the way, again, is Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents, and it's available now on Amazon or, well, if the bookshops were open, I'm sure it would be in the bookshops too. Um, thank you very, very much, Rod, for that. Well, uh, Peter, it was great to be with you. And I just want to mention very briefly, I should have mentioned at the last question, W.H. Auden uh, became a return to Christianity when he was living in New York just before the, just at the outbreak of the Second World War. He went into a movie theater in a, in a heavily German neighborhood of Manhattan they were watching uh, some Nazi propaganda film at the beginning of the movie, and people stood up and screaming about kill the Poles, kill the Poles, because it was about the invasion of Poland. And Auden walked out and said he realized that the only force powerful enough to fight this, to resist this, was Christianity. And he himself returned to his faith then, that one of the greatest English poets of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So if Auden can do it, and he did it for precisely the reason you're pointing out, 
it's there for all of us. So thank you, Peter, so well, thank much you for, for, that, for, thank your... you for that thought. And uh, all the very best to you. Well, and I hope that maybe uh, we can speak again, you know, a year down the line or some other time. It'd be lovely. Very thank good. You. Thank you, friend. Um, bye bye. That's it for So What You're Saying is this week, and uh, we shall see you next time. In the meantime, please uh, do remember, won't you, to subscribe. Thank you. Bye-bye.